Tonight's lecture would not be possible without the help of the Science and Culture Network, and I'd like to invite uh, Jarrett McCleskey to come up here and give an overview uh, of that organization. Well, thanks, Zach. Howdy. Howdy. I can do that because I'm an Aggie as well, uh, which is great. It's good to be, uh, always good to be back in town. Uh, and also, that's a little bit of an explanation of why the Houston chapter of the Science and Culture Network is uh, here in College Station. This is stretching the boundaries of greater Houston just a little bit. But uh, we figured if we're going to stretch it for anything, it would be to get back in, uh, back in College Station. Uh, so there are a couple flyers uh, on the back there. If you're interested in just learning what is this thing, called the Science and Culture Network. Uh, but just briefly an overview, we are a group of like-minded uh, people, uh, folks who share a common belief that, as, a, as the paper here says, that uh, all of nature and ourselves as human beings are uh, the result of an intelligence somewhere behind the scenes rather than just blind, uh, undirected, and mindless processes. And so we want to, from a scientific perspective then, bring forward that discussion by pulling in experts across a variety of the fields, uh, or really all the fields of science as we can, uh, host them uh, for it like uh, Professor Nelson, uh, or Dr. Nelson, who we're going to hear from in a moment, but bring them in, host them in events, large and small, uh, in generally in the greater Houston area, and all engage in question and answer, and just to open people's minds to uh, understand that uh, there is a different way to think about science than what most people and what the popular media and press does for us, uh, and that underneath that is a uh, some pretty clear directives and findings. I think that the latest and greatest science is, science is telling us about uh, intelligence and the designer behind it all. Uh, so, if you are interested in that, uh, we would love to have you part of our uh, our mailing list. Even though this is Again, stretching the boundaries of Greater Houston. Um, there is a flyer as well that, that gives a brief and very small print, but an overview of four, a series of four events that we are putting on in uh, the Woodlands area. So not that far, it's 90 minutes away, actually, um, in the next, over the next four weeks. All of them want the, a kickoff tomorrow night with a, a large version of this event where we expect uh, several hundred people together with Dr. Nelson. Um, as well, and then a, a series of uh, scientists, experts coming in, including uh, Dr. James Tour of Rice University. Some of you may know uh, Dr. Tour, who is uh, just one of the top, literally one of the top scientists and chemists in the world. So we're excited. Uh, we're excited to be partnering uh, here with the Rasha Christie Group. We look forward to doing this kind of thing uh, more in the future as well. Again, I'm happy to talk to you afterwards, but uh, it's great to see all of you here tonight. I know you'll enjoy the evening. So thank you. Lastly, uh, before I introduce Dr. Nelson, um, I do need to make one remark. Uh, because the topic of origins is uh, particularly controversial, and there are people of all different perspectives, Rasher Christie does not officially endorse or promote one view over another. Uh, and we have members from everything from young earth creationists to old earth creationists to evolutionary creationists. I say that to appease so I don't get uh, beat up at the leadership meeting. <laughs> it's now my honor to introduce uh, Dr. Nelson. Uh, Dr. Paul Nelson studied evolutionary theory and the philosophy of science at the University of Chicago, where he received a PhD in 1998, with a dissertation examining Darwin's theory of universal common descent. Since that time, he's been a senior fellow of the Discovery Institute, and from 2004 to the present, the adjunct professor in the Master of Arts program in Science and Religion at Biola University. Please welcome Dr. Paul Nelson. It's a pleasure to be here. This is my first time in College Station. Uh, we got to look at a little bit of your beautiful campus today, and I'm learning that you have lots of traditions, and I hope I don't accidentally step on something that I shouldn't. <laughs> like, the, I guess, the grass outside this building you're not allowed to walk on, so I'll be careful not to do that. But it's a treat to be down here. Uh, when I left Chicago, where I live, it looked like um, an afternoon in a bad Victorian novel set in London, cold and rainy. Come down here, things are blooming, it's green and gorgeous, so I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. All right, there's Humpty. We are going to see him throughout the evening. Uh, 
He's well balanced there, looking very jaunty in his nice blue pinstripe suit. Humpty will represent a concept about the nature of life that we're going to probe. And that is that we can't make life, but we can certainly destroy it. And the arrow of causality in that relationship, if you will, goes one direction only. You guys know the nursery rhyme? He goes down off the wall, and he, there's no putting him back together again. And we live in this universe. We have for a long time. It's the universe set by the Darwinian worldview, which isn't just a biological theory. In fact, I would argue that the biological theory that Darwin introduced, evolution by natural selection, is really a minor player when you look at the philosophical change that occurred in the 19th century about the nature of science itself. With the Darwinian revolution, the rules of science changed, and we still live with those rules. So we find ourselves in Darwin's universe with these scientific ideas that all living things on Earth share a common ancestor in one great tree of life, that natural selection built that tree, that is especially the complexity of living things, and that life came from non-life naturally. This is what we're going to talk about tonight. Now, Darwin himself never published anything about this. He was very careful not to venture into the area. In a letter to a friend, he said, you might as well ask about the origin of matter. In fact, the only thing he ever actually published about it in the origin of species was to say that life was created, uh, breathed into the first living form by a creator with a capital C. Uh, but the Darwinian paradigm, that is the worldview scientifically that flows from Darwin, held, held to this view, and it's what we have today. So if you take a uh, origin of life course here at Texas A&M, this is what you'll be taught, right? That there's some unknown natural pathway from non-living chemicals to the living state. But really, the philosophical universe we inhabit which I think is really much more important than the scientific theories because it determines what counts as evidence, what counts as an explanation scientifically, goes by this rule. And we'll see it a few times tonight. Now, this is a long polysyllabic name for a very simple but very powerful rule that says when you do science, when you put on a lab coat, when you put your eye to the eyepiece of a microscope, when you investigate the natural world, you have to follow this rule. Now this verb, must, is an imperative. Okay, it's what I used to say to my daughters when they were teenagers and they wanted to go out with their friends and I knew their homework wasn't done or their room was untidy. They didn't have a choice, right? They must do something. And then to make sure we don't miss the point, the National Academy of Sciences adds the logical modifier here only to say when you pop open your toolkit of possible causes in science, what you're going to find in there is natural things and processes only. Think about it this way. You're listening to me right now. I hope you're paying attention. You have a mind, right? You're absorbing what I'm saying. You have intelligence. You have agency. When you sit down at a restaurant, take the menu in your hand, you're going to make a choice on the basis of your agency. So these Concepts or these kinds of causes are real. We know that they're real. You use them every day. Couldn't survive without them. But the rule of methodological naturalism says, historically, in the history of the universe, these kinds of causes came ultimately from this. This is what ultimately started the universe and gave rise to these kinds of causes so that Mind or intelligence or agency on the evolutionary narrative are late arriving on the scene. This is what's primary. So really, methodological naturalism isn't just a rule about how to do science. It actually makes claims about the nature of reality. That when you go to investigate a puzzle in nature, you're not allowed to invoke this if you can't in some way connect it with that. Okay, we'll come back to that later. And what happens is, ultimately, this dissolves away, and physics, meaning undirected natural processes, becomes ultimate reality. Now, that rule constrains what you're allowed to say about reality, about physical reality. So here's a little Venn diagram. Methodological naturalism puts us in here. So you're looking at a puzzle like we will tonight, such as the origin of life, 
And you say, well, you know, cells look very complex. Is it possible that they could have been caused by an intelligence? Methodological naturalism is like a referee. It takes out its whistle and blows the whistle and says, you've gone over the boundary line. Back inside. Back inside that boundary line. But we know, or even if you're an atheist or skeptic, you should entertain the possibility that there may be things that are true about the universe that can't be fit within that circle. So the circle of what might be true, indicated here by the dotted line, and this of course is just a cartoon, that circle could extend indefinitely out to the horizon. What might be true is vastly greater than what methodological naturalism lets us infer scientifically. All right, so there's sort of a philosophical background. Now let's get back to Humpty. Humpty is going to say, what happens if I fall off this wall and I'm a cell? Well, that's the question of minimal complexity in biology. And it's really a very simple question, no pun intended. It says, how simple can an organism be and yet exist? So we're not talking about a blue whale. We're not talking about one of the gorgeous live oaks outside on the campus here or you and me. We're talking about single-celled organisms like bacteria. What does such an organism need just to survive, to be alive in a petri dish or alive in a, in a test tube? And this is the theater in which our drama will take place. Okay, so up here, you're unquestionably alive. That's all of you. That's the bacteria in your large intestine and the tiny little mites that live on your eyebrows and your eyelashes. Down here, you're unquestionably not alive. All right, that's the asphalt in the parking lot outside. And there's an interesting gray zone here in the middle that gets especially interesting as you approach this lower threshold of the living state. So there are viruses that have more DNA than bacteria. They have millions of base pairs of DNA. They're enormously large. We call them viruses because they can't replicate their own genetic information. They have to hijack the replication machinery of a living cell to make more copies of themselves, but they're very big. Mimi virus is one of these critters. Where are they? Are they up here or are they down here? Well, they might be really close to that line. So you can, you can see here in this, in this schematic that there's a kind of gray zone here, but we definitely have alive, not alive at either end. Now, the normal approach to solving the problem of the origin of life is to start bottom up, okay? The reason for that is most scientists look at this and they say, well, once upon a time on this planet, there were no cells. There were volcanoes and all kinds of geological activity, maybe pools where chemicals were collecting. Somehow the living state came to be where it didn't exist before from chemistry along an unknown natural pathway. And then at some point life came into existence. So people approach the pr problem bottom up because they think that's what happened once upon a time on this planet. And let's just recapitulate it and see how it happened. So you can think about this as looking for the sufficient conditions for the living state, like a recipe, right? Eggs, flour, cream, the right kind of container, maybe throw some vanilla in there. If you get the recipe right, you should get out a cake over here at the end. Or if you take organic chemistry, you know there's a lot of complicated syntheses involved follow your lab manual correctly, you should get the right product over here. You're looking for the sufficient conditions, you bring them together and life emerges. This is a very hard problem, but this is what most origin of life researchers do. But we can come at the, well, here's a little cartoon. We're putting the parts together, right? And if we get the recipe correct, we'll achieve the living state. And again, as I said, the reason for approaching it that way is most scientists think that's what actually happened, but we can come top down. With a top down analysis, you start with a living cell, right? You've got something that's unquestionably alive and you say, how much of you can I take away and stay above this threshold? How much of you can I subtract and, and still have you growing in my test tube? Now, you're not looking for the recipe, you're looking for the necessary conditions rather than the sufficient conditions. Life subtracting A, B, C, and so forth. Are you still there? Are you still alive and growing in the test tube? Now you're looking for the parts list. And when you come top, top down, you take things away. Okay, so we take away F, yeah, still growing. Didn't need that. Wasn't essential under lab conditions. Didn't need H either. 
But at some point, we're going to hit a part that will stop the cell. It'll die. And we know doing that, we've come down here to a point where we took away something that cell couldn't do without. So Humpty's saying, all right, push me off the wall. You'll find out that if you want an egg, you can't drop it from a height. The stability of me requires certain things that are non-negotiables. The important point to keep in mind as we go forward is, think about this as a mountain in Switzerland, our two approaches have to meet in the middle. Now I've turned the problem on its side here, right? So crew one is, let's say, coming from the north. Crew two is coming from the south. If you're going to have a functional tunnel cutting through that mountain, these tunneling crews must meet here somewhere in the middle. They've got to be, there's got to be some kind of communication between them to achieve that. And the problem here is if our bottom-up approach and our top-down approach can't meet in the middle, we're going to have a, a, a real difficulty with explaining the origin of life via a strictly natural process. So let's look at the leading bottom-up approach right now in science. It's called the RNA world hypothesis, and it's very elegant. It's a very powerful, elegant idea. <clears throat> Once upon a time, when people looked at the origin of life, they, say, they said, we have a chicken and egg problem that we can't solve. DNA, as probably many of you already know, is the main information carrier in life. It's a wonderful storage medium. Recently, there was a headline that uh, a team, I think in Cambridge, I'm not sure where they were, were able to store a complete movie in DNA. And it may well be in our lifetime that DNA becomes the preferred storage medium for large amounts of data that we artificially put it in and we synthesize DNA to carry large amounts of information. Wonderful information storage medium, terrible actor. It's a rather dull molecule with respect to all the work that needs to be done in the cell. Proteins, by contrast, are wonderful actors. They speed up reactions many fold over what would happen if they weren't present there in the cell. But to build a protein, right, to give the specs to construct a protein, all that information is stored here. So to get the information out of DNA into proteins, you need DNA, but to get it out, you need proteins. So this should be familiar to you, those of you who have studied molecular biology. People looking at the origin of life said, how are you going to break through that loop? You can't have all of this present at once. You've got to start with one or the other, but they're codependent. They need each other. Now, the great thing about RNA is like DNA, it can store information. It's nucleic acid. It carries a lot of information. But single-stranded RNA, unlike DNA, can fold up and do interesting things for you in the cell. So, for instance, in the molecular machines in your cells called ribosomes that make proteins, the active site in the ribosome is actually RNA. RNA is doing the work in that molecular machine. So here's our RNA folded up nicely, and let's say it can make copies of itself. If it can do that, natural selection can kick in, and you can get some kind of evolutionary process up and running. So RNA world hypothesis seemed to solve this chicken and egg problem because you could both have an information storage medium and an actor doing both jobs. All right, so there's the story. And very short form. And the idea is that the initial replicators that could undergo natural selection weren't complete cells, but were rather small self-replicating RNAs called ribozymes that somehow became encapsulated in membranes. And once they could make copies, natural selection could begin to operate and you head towards the living state. Like I said, elegant, powerful hypothesis, but lots of people don't believe it. And they don't believe it because they're a crazy intelligent design advocate like I am. They don't believe it because it doesn't work. All right. Stuart Kaufman is one such skeptic. He's an origin of life researcher at the Santa Fe Institute. Some of you may have read some of his papers or books. And a long time ago, this is, this is now 22 years ago, he said, I don't buy it and here's why. There's one problem that I find the most insurmountable, and it's the one most rarely talked about. All living things seem to have a minimal complexity below which it is impossible to go. So I think now again about our top-down subtractive analysis. He says there's a lower threshold, and you can't get below it. This is the basement. 
You can discover it. I'll give you some examples in just a moment of how that's done experimentally. Below that, the living state is gone. You take away parts, boom, 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 dead. You took away something that the cell could not do without. And Kaufman says, this is true for every living thing that we know. So think about me, grisly thought experiment. I won't subject any of you to this. I'm sure there's a hospital here on campus with a surgical suite. And walk me over there, put me under general anesthetic, get a very skilled surgeon, and he takes off my right arm, right here where it joins my trunk. So I'm wheeled out into the recovery area. The anesthetic wears off. I come to, I'm conscious, I sit up, and it's gone. My right arm is gone. I'm unquestionably alive, all right? But I've lost one of my limbs. Now, same operating theater, same surgeon. This time, all he does is he takes his scalpel and he goes through my brain stem right back here where the respiratory control centers are. Doesn't touch anything else. You can't even see the incision, it's so small. Now I'm wheeled out into recovery and I'm reaching room temperature, <laughs> okay? The monitor is flatline, mm, right? It's over. He hasn't touched anything else about me. What that tells you is the parts of our biology are not all equally important for viability. You cannot do without your brainstem. Uh, Craig Venter, the, the human genome researcher, was a medic in Vietnam as a young man. And one of the things motivating his research into the problem we're going to talk about tonight is young kids, 18, 19 year old GIs, would be brought into a field hospital, all torn up from shrapnel, from machine gun fire, you name it. You know, just shredded, but alive and conscious. Their bodies were badly damaged, but their vital systems were still operating. Another kid would be brought in, and you couldn't see anything wrong with him. But he's at room temperature. He's stone cold dead. And Venter said he once rolled a kid over that looked like that, and in the middle of his back was a tiny little hole you could barely see. And they followed the path, and it was a piece of shrapnel that went into his heart. One of those vital systems was hit. So what we have here is... When we analyze living things, whether us or single cells, not everything is equally important. So, sorry, I went too fast. Kaufman goes on, he goes, all the cells that we know have at least the molecular diversity of pleromona. Now that's the generic name for a type of bacteria right here, mycoplasma. This is a very stripped down cell. It has just over half a million base pairs of DNA, about 580,000 base pairs of DNA, smaller than many viruses. To keep these cells alive in culture, you have to give them pretty much everything. They can't make any amino acids for themselves, for instance. They need cholesterol. The, the, the growth media, the culture media for, for mycoplasma is a rich buffet of biomolecules because their normal environment is to parasitize the epithelia in us in our airway or in our genital tract where they're constantly bathed in nutrients. So what they've done is they've jettisoned a lot of their internal hardware because they can just get it from, from us, right? But this cell is free living. You can grow it. And in one sense, it does represent a very simple kind of cell, although it never survived for five minutes on the early Earth. So Kaufman says, why is there this minimal, minimal complexity? Your antennae should quiver. I love a question like this because it points both into biology and the history of life, but also into the philosophy of science. So let's do a top-down approach, right? We're going to take stuff away and say, how simple can we get with respect to this cell? How much of its hardware can we jettison? So here's the parts list. Now, I realize you can't read this, but mycoplasma was one of the first bacterial species to have all of its DNA sequenced. This was done by Claire Fraser at the and colleagues at Craig Venter's Institute for Genomic Research, published in 1995. I remember when this paper was published, I was finishing up my PhD. And it was very exciting because for the first time, you could see all the parts. So you can think about this like a parts list for your computer, right? The funny thing is, all the parts aren't there because some of the parts are unknown. We'll come to that in a moment. But what that previous diagram was showing you were the proteins that fall into these various functional classes. So in this one, for instance, this is the biggest. 
The ribosome is a really big machine. It's a big molecular machine. So there are lots of proteins and RNAs associated with building that big machine. But all of these functional classes has, have many proteins associated with them. Jointly, they represent the living state. Here's what some of them look like. In the sort of ribbon and barrel diagram that you would get from the protein data bank. This protein is involved in finding the midline of the bacterial cell so it can divide. Okay, so, you know, I'm here tonight, but I have other obligations uh, coming up. I'm going to go to Panama next month. It would be great if I could split myself in two, right? <laughs> The other Paul Nelson would write all the boring articles and all that sort of thing. So I, I get a nice quiet room with some candles, right? And I find my midline, 50% point, and I split myself in two. Now, that is not how human beings replicate. We have more interesting ways of passing on our genetic information to the next generation. That is how bacteria replicate. It is a functional challenge for them to find their center line because they're going to put a whole chromosome in one half, a whole chromosome in the other half, and this protein does that job. It's a midline locator. Now think about that shape and compare that shape to this one. This is a nursery for baby proteins, literally. In this open central chamber here, baby proteins that are coming out of the ribosome, they're long linear strings of amino acids and they're very sticky. And the interior of bacterial cells is extremely crowded. Jim Shapiro, who's a microbiologist at University of Chicago, told me once, he said, the interior of a bacterial cell makes Hong Kong look like Nebraska on a Sunday afternoon. Just everything piled on top of everything, right? So not all proteins, but some of them have to be isolated in a chaperone complex like this to fold properly so they can perform their functions. So that's what happens in this central chamber here. Actually, this is a multi-protein complex uh, and it's essential, okay? If you don't have chaperones, you can't make proteins, you'll die. Compare that shape to this one. Now, these are all different, and the reason they're different is at the molecular level, they're doing different jobs. So this is a protein involved in the process of making proteins. As the ribosome is moving down a messenger RNA strand, elongation factor comes into play. All right, we could go through this whole list, you know, all of these proteins in mycoplasma and, and you discover a tremendous amount of molecular diversity, but the question we want to answer is, how much of that can we get rid of? Surely not all of those parts are necessary for that cell. So this experiment has been done several times, actually. First published in Science in 1999, and then they refined the experiment and did it again, published in Proceedings of the National Academy in 2006. And here's what they did. It's really striking. They took a piece of DNA called the transposon, that randomly integrates itself into other DNA. Okay, now these are not to scale. I made this big so you could read the label. But here's the circular chromosome of a bacterial cell of mycoplasma. And you can think about it this way. The transposon, because it's randomly integrating, it doesn't care where it lands. It might crash right into, integrate into this essential gene. Maybe that gene codes for a, a protein in the ribosome you can't do without disrupts its reading frame, so you can't get a functional protein from that anymore, and the cells will talk back to you. You'll have no activity. You won't be able to plate them out. They're dead. No growth, okay? Now, if you do that often enough, so you introduce the transposons into the bacterial cells, they integrate, and at least one of these integration sites hit essential genes. Cells are dead. Same here. At least one of those hit a gene you can't do without. Sometimes, however, the transposon will integrate, and it won't hit anything essential. And those cells will tell you they'll grow. You'll be able to plate them out. You'll have colonies there on your agar dish, right? You do this often enough. You look at these cells, and you look where the transposons are, and you work your way around that chromosome, and you figure out the very fact that I see a transposon in a living cell tells me that that integration site didn't hit something essential. These populations then will let you map out where the hardware is that you can't do without. And as I said, this experiment has been done several times, not just with mycoplasma, but with other prokaryotes, other bacterial cells. It turns out that about three quarters of the, this is the normal wild type mycoplasma, 
about three quarters of its protein coding genes are essential under laboratory growth conditions. And those are optimal, right? That's graduate students and postdocs saying, please don't die, please don't die, right? You're giving the cell everything that it could possibly want. That's not a yellow spring or you know, a hot stone in yellow spring or an arctic zone. But this is the kicker. This is the thing that when I read this paper, I got goosebumps, literally. 110 genes of unknown function in that set of 382. Nearly a third of the essential hardware of the simplest cell that we know, nobody knows what it's doing. That is not the message you would get from a molecular biology textbook that tells you we pretty much understand how biochemistry works from bacteria to blue whales. That's a lot of unknown hardware. So in their paper in 1999, Hutchinson, the lead author on this, and his colleagues said, the presence of so many genes of unknown function tells us we don't really know what the basic mechanisms are of cellular life. Okay, that is one of the messages, but that's not the evolutionary or origin of life message. Here's the origin of life message. Take stuff away, you take stuff away, you find out where your foundation is, the bottom layer. You can't get any simpler. If the bottom layer is 382 genes, 110 of which you don't know what they're doing, you are way, way above what undirected chemistry can achieve. In other words, your two, to go this way, your two tunneling crews are miles apart. Miles apart. But there's another way we can come at this same puzzle by a, a thought experiment. All right, so we're out in the galaxy somewhere in the Milky Way, planet Z Beta. And we see an entity and it's doing this. It's replicating itself with high fidelity. Now, we don't know what, it, what it's made of at the molecular level, but we can see it's making copies of itself and they're very high fidelity copies, right? So we grab one of these or a bunch of them, we take them back to our ship and they look like this and they're performing all of these functions. They're reproducing. They're transporting selectively across their boundary between themselves and the world. They're metabolizing and converting energy. They're replicating and storing information and so forth. I would submit to you that if you saw an entity doing that, you would say that is alive, even if I don't know anything at all about its biochemistry. The way that we recognize living things, first of all, is not in terms of what they're made of, it's in terms of what they do. So Aristotle in Athens, two millennia ago, could distinguish an ant crossing a tabletop from a pebble on that same surface because the ant had functions that the pebble did not. The ant moved in a directional way towards the wine glass or whatever, right? So you see an entity doing this, you're going to call it alive, even if you don't know anything at all about how it's built at the molecular level. Now, which of these can we take away that's arguably not essential? Probably about two thirds of the people living to me haven't done this yet, at least not to their knowledge. Not that hard, you guys. It's just a thought experiment. Okay, I'll give you a hint. On March 16, 1992, in Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, my wife Suzanne and I successfully accomplished this, although she did all the work, I was a minor contributor. Right, cesarean section, that young lady is 25 years old now doing research in <clears throat> Panama. Oh, come on, it's not that hard. That one. Some of you in this room have not done this yet, at least not to your knowledge. You have not passed on genetic information to the next generation you're alive. You're unquestionably alive, right? So arguably, this is the one that we could jettison, okay? Now you have to live forever. And that entity has to live forever. Now watch what happens when we start taking away other functions. This will rapidly cease to be anything that we would call alive because it turns out that all of these functions are interrelated. You take away one and you lose others as a consequence. So we'll take away reproduction and let's take away transport, right? Now what's gonna happen? That entity is either going to starve to death or explode with waste products if it's continuing to metabolize and convert energy. Every living thing we know transports selectively across its boundary. You don't take anything, just anything in, you don't put just anything out. Our, our 
systems are very selective in terms of how they interact with the environment. So we've lost transport. Death is imminent, but let's speed it up. Let's take away information replication and information storage and transfer, which are related. Now we've lost the templates that we need to build the molecular players that are going to perform these essential metabolic and energy conversion functions. Those are gone. And the, the degradation is going to accelerate. We'll lose these. OK, they're gone. And that's a bubble. That's not a living thing. That's what Sidney Fox, the origin of life researcher, excuse me, the origin of life researcher at the University of Florida made thousands of, and only Sidney Fox and his graduate students thought they were alive, okay? That's not a living thing. All of these connections have to be there. And the Humpty Dumpty effect tells you that when you take one away, you lose them all inevitably, and it happens very, very rapidly. And Humpty says, yeah, push me off the wall, you're going to lose it all. All right, now, the moral is, Putatively simple functions like reproduction aren't simple at all. A necessary condition of Darwin's theory of natural selection is being able to make copies of yourself. But it turns out making copies of yourself is incredibly complicated. And you can't have natural selection unless you can do that. So natural selection as a process is not going to solve this problem for us. Now, I'm in a Starbucks as I often am with a friend who's a skeptic. Maybe he's an atheist, maybe he's an agnostic. He doesn't accept intelligent design. And we're having this conversation about this puzzle. And he says, Paul, you are so stupid. And I often hear that. My friends are rather blunt, OK? And he says, look, breaking something has nothing to do with how it came to be. All right, here's a bridge being dynamited over some river. I love seeing these videos because they always go down so beautifully, you know, boom, 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 down. In fact, I tried to embed a, a video in this talk, and I couldn't do it. I really wanted to drop that bridge in the river for you. But you get the idea, right? So my friend says, look, breaking something is, is really unrelated to how you build it. This is not how we build bridges. So really, breaking something is not telling you anything about the causal process of how it came to be. The Humpty Dumpty effect is an illusion. All right. Actually, that's just the point. The point is, having the stuff, the materials, the ribosomes, the DNA, the membrane, all of that, having the stuff won't give you a bridge or a cell. And origin of life researchers like David Deemer at UC Santa Cruz have understood this for a long time. So in a really interesting paper, David Deemer says, look, we could do it this way. Let's model the Humpty Dumpty effect by putting some bacteria in a culture and subjecting it to a sterilizing step. In some cases, you can do this with sound. You can, you can sterilize or kill bacteria using sound. It's called sonication. Now, we put the contents of that sterilization step into a flask with nutrients. So there's plenty of food if they need it, right? And Deemer says, look, no living cells are present, but the whole genome is there. All the DNA is there, along with ribosomes, these big molecular factories that make proteins. They're there. They're present in the mix. ATP is there, your energy source, your main fuel for all of life, thousands of functional enzymes. He says, would a living condition arise, uh, excuse me, a living system arise? No. Nothing would happen other, other than the slow degradative reactions of hydrolysis. Water starts attacking everything. It starts attacking nucleic acids. It starts attacking the proteins. Everything starts breaking down. He goes on, even though you have virtually the entire complement of molecules associated with the living state, what's been lost is the extreme level of order characteristic of cytoplasm, that's the interior of cells that we see today. Really fascinating paper. So he's describing the Humpty Dumpty effect, and he's saying, give me a bacterial cell, just pierce its membrane, and that, those materials that origin of life researchers are trying so hard to build are going to go in one direction only, towards their parts. They're going to start breaking up, and what you will never, ever recover is the living state. And you know what? No one worries about this. No one puts surgical instruments into an autoclave, cranks it up to 400 or whatever, 500 degrees, and worries that when they take the instruments out, they're still going to have bacterial cells to worry about to cause infection. 
You don't worry if the manufacturing process is correct that when you open a can of tuna, that it's going to be swarming with bacteria. So when we sterilize, which we do millions of times a day all over this planet, we know we're going in one direction because these relationships are real. And when you disrupt any of them, you lose all of them. Now, there's a deeper message here. This is a paper that when I read it, it was one of those things that told me that going into science was worth doing. You know, I, when I was 17, I wanted to be a painter. I actually went to art school for two years. It was so miserable that I said, well, God, you can't want me to be this unhappy. What do you want me to do with my life? And he said, how about biology? I was like, biology, are you kidding me? Yes. God wasn't kidding me. It was worth it because of this kind of paper. Really, really interesting. Now, because of the press of time, I don't have, I'm not able to go into all the details, but I'll summarize what these two scientists did. They said, there's a paradox in living things that when you look at their parts, there's only a few arrangements that will give you life. There are infinitely greater arrangements that will give you death. And the Leventhal paradox of the interactome, it's a fancy title, but it's a simple idea. The interactome is all the parts within a cell in relationships to, e to each other in the living state. And what they do is they count those parts and they say, how many ways are there of being dead? Well, the ways of being dead vastly outnumber the ways of being alive. So what they point out is when you disrupt one of these essential conditions in a cell, you leave the tiny neighborhood where you are alive and you begin a random walk in the enormous neighborhood where you're dead, and the probabilities dictate you will never get back to the state where you were alive, even though that's possible abstractly. So here's how Dawkins puts it. Beautiful passage from The Blind Watchmaker. He says, however many ways there are of being alive, it is certain there are vastly more ways of being dead or rather not alive. So here's a little cartoon. There's our box. You're alive if you're in there. All right? You've got everything you need as a cell or a human being. That's your envelope of variability, let's call it. You can be alive if you're within that space. Well, let's put that space in the realm of all the possible ways there are of being dead. And it comes out mathematically to look like this. That's why a cell will never come back to life, even though all the stuff is there. Because once you leave that tiny neighborhood of being alive, you'll never get back. You will never, ever get back because this space of being dead is so much bigger than the one of being alive. And Humpty, Humpty knows that. And Humpty says, you're never going to meet that other crew if it's undirected chemistry that you're counting on. Now, we come to a point and we step back, we say, all right, let's think philosophically now. Maybe it's possible that life was intelligently designed. Before we answer that question, though, I want to give you one answer right now in the scientific literature for how this puzzle is solved by a guy that I really respect at the NCBI in Washington named Eugene Kunin, who came here from Russia. Kunin looks at the problem we're talking about tonight. In particular, he looks at the origin of the replication system. And he says, we have two paradoxes that we can't solve. To get started in evolution, he says, we need a system of far greater complexity to get us going. But that means we're not solving anything. If we need a more complicated system to get us going, this, he says, is a puzzle that defies or defeats conventional evolutionary thinking. So he's, he's keyed in to the problem, all right? And by the way, this is journal Biology Direct. It's open access. So anyone can go and get the papers. And what I love about this journal is they publish the paper, and then right after the paper, they publish all the reviewer reports. And you can watch the referees or the reviewers, other scientists, interacting with the author back and forth. It's the healthiest way imaginable of doing science. Normally, that process of critique is hidden from public view. This journal has the great practice of putting it there where you can read it for yourself. So he goes on and he says, there's no advantage to having the translation system in cells because you can't get any yield from it unless it's already working. He says, again, this defeats conventional evolutionary thinking. So his solution, as the title suggests here, is to make the universe really, really, really big. In fact, infinite. Because any small probability can be swamped if you, if you 
buy enough tickets, right? You can win any lottery if you buy all the tickets. So what he says is, this can happen by chance if you give me infinity. Okay, at that point, and I respect Kunin. He's one of my favorite scientists. I love reading his papers. But at this point, he has left science and he's gone to a casino. No one should go in a casino without a, a basic course in probability. And this woman could probably pick it up in about two hours. These machines are mathematically designed to take all your money. If you sit down at one of those machines with $1,000 and you stay there, it doesn't matter how much you win. If you stay there, the machine is, will, will, mathematically, it's certain, the machine will take all of your money and you will have none. That's how casinos operate. That's why no one can make a living <laughs> sitting here running these, right? When you appeal to chance in this way, you have left the realm of reason and gone somewhere else. Because the evidence that Kunin is looking at, that I, some of which I've showed you tonight, points clearly towards a cause that was not bottom up. And rather than accept the clear message of the evidence, Kunin parks himself in front of one of those. All right, I'm going to skip our tunneling crews. You've seen them. Now, why can't we do this? Here's our rule. But this rule was not recognized by Isaac Newton. It wasn't recognized by Darwin himself as a young man. When Darwin set sail on the Beagle, he didn't believe this. So evolutionary theory itself was born out of a philosophical cradle where this rule didn't apply. So why not do this? Why not turn the arrows around? Right? It's equally likely, just even if I were an atheist, I would be willing to consider this, it's equally likely that this is primary and this is derivative. And the fundamental stuff of reality is not physics. The fundamental stuff of reality, the deepest cause that there is, is something like this. All right, I, I would be willing to entertain that possibility in the light of science itself. All right. One last worry. You guys have been very patient, and then we'll call it a night and take some Q&A. My friend in the Starbucks, sitting there with his coffee, listens politely, and he says, Ah, Paul... The God of the gaps has got you. You have just jammed an intelligent designer into an open puzzle in science, and science is relentless. The expanding wavefront of knowledge is going to sweep over the origin of life puzzle at some point in the future, and God will get another pink unemployment slip. Okay. All right. The God of the gaps worry is real in the sense that it's always possible to be wrong. Okay. Even in daily life, right? I wouldn't have asked her out if I knew she was such a blank, right? <laughs> I wouldn't have voted for him if I knew he couldn't spell tap, right? Um, you, you, you can't even be sure that your favorite parking place is there from day to day, right? And science, you're always running the risk of being wrong. So if you're worried about being wrong, don't go into science, all right? So in that respect, the God of the gaps is a real, a real worry. But it's just the problem of induction. And it, everybody faces it. But my friend in the Starbucks is more focused in his criticism. He's saying, you, Paul, in particular, have fallen prey to a problem. And my response would go like this. Look, not every question we put to nature is going to be answered in the terms that we would like. So here's a little thought experiment. It's 2037, and we've colonized Mars. Tens of thousands of people up there working in labs. And I've got a nephew. And in 2037, I'll be pretty old. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to tell you actually how old I am because I'm pretty old, all right? But I'll be pretty old. But let's say I'm still around and more or less with it. And I take out my 2037 equivalent of an iPhone. I'm down here somewhere, right? And I want to talk to my nephew who's working up there. So I punch in his number. And I have a question that I'm putting to science. I want to know how I can have a conversation in real time, as we're about to do in a moment with the Q&A, with my nephew on Mars. There it is. How can Earth dwellers communicate in real time with Mars dwellers? Now, that is a properly formed English sentence. It poses a puzzle to nature. I want to insert some knowledge into that gap created by that question. And what should you tell me? Come on, you guys have had physics. A lot of you have had physics. Is it? Why not? It's a speed limit, right? 
The speed limit is well defined. It doesn't matter how often I ask the question or how sincerely I ask it or how hard I do the research. What you should do is not try to answer it. You should slide a physics textbook across the table to me and say, read about the speed of light. All right. At its closest, Mars is about 35 million miles away in the fall. Okay. There's our speed limit. There's the distance. So I'll be able to put his number in and then go check my email, feed the cat, uh, make myself some coffee. Six and a half minutes later, roughly, I'll hear him say, hey, Uncle Paul, how's it going? And now he'll have to wait six minutes for my next statement. The puzzle I'm putting to nature cannot be solved. Even though I can form the problem, nature doesn't work that way. And what nature says to me is, Paul, you're doomed to frustration if you don't listen to me. You've got to listen to me. Not every question you ask of nature is going to have an answer in the terms that you prefer. So if your question that you're putting to nature is how did life come to be by an unknown natural pathway, and that's not actually what happened, there is no knowledge to insert in that gap. Not any more knowledge than is here. There is no knowledge here to insert in that gap. Not every gap that you have in your understanding is real. What you do in a case like that is you stop asking the question. The rational thing to do is not to keep going up the alley until your nose is bloody, right? Walking into the brick wall at the end, you turn around and you leave. So there are many questions right now in historical biology. That's the parts of biology concerned with the history of life that aren't really based on the evidence. They're based on a philosophy, the philosophy of naturalism. If that's not true, then your question can't be answered. And there is no knowledge gap to fill. So last slide, well, second to last. This is a healthy way to go about looking at puzzles of the nature. Keep both of these boxes open. Even if you're an atheist, you want the universe to be able to surprise you. And you know that this is real. Every time you get a text on your phone, without even thinking about it, you know that there's somebody at the other end of that resembling this. This is perfectly real, very powerful, but kind of stupid. Okay, does the same thing over and over. All right, I'm done. Humpty will take us into the Q&A. Thank you for being so patient. I really appreciate it. Um, so the first question is, um, is there any way to detect supernatural causation itself? Or are we basically just ruling out all possible natural causes and then once we've ruled all or most of those out, we can infer? Um, Good infer question. Um, you'll notice that in my talk, I never use the adjective supernatural. And that's because, frankly, I don't know what it means. Okay? I do know what intelligent means. Um, there's, there are many problems with the adjective supernatural that, that make it impossible to continue the discussion because, you, you, in a sense, you leave the realm of where you can reason and you go into a, a, a different sphere where it's much harder to know what you're talking about. Um, I'm not evading the question, but let me illustrate this by a very simple sort of thought experiment. Let's imagine that uh, the digital file that's being created of this talk right now on this computer is rendered down to ones and zeros, binary code, which is actually how it's being stored right now electronically, and we blast that out into space on a really powerful transmitter. And it would have to be really powerful to get the signal out into other parts of the galaxy. So ET's out there, he's listening with a very good radio telescope. That string of ones and zeros comes in and he begins to decode it. And he says, it looks like there's a guy named Paul Nelson who's giving a talk on the philosophy of science and origin of life, and he's talking about big egg that fell down, right? And then people are asking him questions. In other words, there's a conversation going on. Now, on ET's planet, a bunch of scientists get together and they say, we have to explain this in terms of physics because we accept methodological naturalism too, and we've got to give a bottom-up account for the origin of that binary string in terms of known physical laws and principles. Maybe we can throw chemistry in there too. And another radio astronomer says, that's impossible. 
What's happening there is perfectly natural in one sense. I mean, there's a guy talking and people are listening and they're asking him questions, but no collection of physical laws or regularities can explain the origin of that binary string. That information string requires agents, requires a guy named Paul and the people in the audience, and those agents cannot be reduced to physics without losing our ability to explain what we see. So the point of this thought experiment is if you divide up the world into natural versus supernatural, where are you going to leave room for things like playing the violin, writing a piece of music, writing a poem, compiling computer code, discovering something new in science. Nearly everything that we do as human beings is intelligently caused, but it's not supernatural in any sense of that word. So don't carve up the world into natural versus supernatural. A much better distinction is natural versus intelligent. And I believe in miracles. Okay, I'm a Christian. On Easter morning, the tomb was empty. At the wedding at Cana, to spare social embarrassment to those people, Jesus made 180 gallons of really good wine, okay? Cabernet, all right? Or maybe it was Merlot, one of my favorites. I believe in miracles, but I think the adjective supernatural forecloses understanding. And you're much better off to say, is it natural or intelligent? Because with intelligent, that adjective, we know what that means. I can see a bunch of intelligent people listening to me. So when someone says, you know, can we detect intelligent causation? Yes, you do it every day. You do it every day. A few years ago, I went to hear a lecture by a friend of mine at the University of Chicago, a historian. It was in March. Chicago in March is cold, all right? I come back to my car, my Honda Odyssey minivan. The right passenger window is broken, the front one. Glass everywhere. Mm. So I stick my head through the opening. The McDonald's bag is still there. The tattered atlas of Cook County is still there. My daughter's soccer equipment is still there. What's not there? The Garmin. The leather case for the Garmin. The Garmin cable. The Garmin stand. Okay. I am not going to sit down on the curb and start running through all the possible natural causes that can get only the valuable objects out of a Honda minivan. <laughs> No one in this room is going to do that. You detect intelligence every day, and you put great weight on those detections. You can do it. It's not mysterious. It's not spooky. But in some important sense, it's not natural, meaning physics caused. You are not caused by physics. You are a bona fide agent with a free will. So long-winded answer, bonus thought experiment. The point of the question is important but don't get hung up on the adjective supernatural. That's, I ended that one. Okay, so I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so the second question we have here is, uh, does pan, panspermia count as intelligent design, um, or does it just push the problem uh, back basically another level? Another good question. For those of you who don't know, panspermia is the hypothesis that life on this planet was sent here deliberately by an alien intelligence. And Francis Crick, co-discoverer of the molecular structure of DNA for which he won a Nobel Prize, another of my scientific heroes, in 1981 seriously proposed this as, a, as an explanation for the origin of life on this planet. Because he said, it looks like the conditions that would need to be satisfied here on Earth would require a miracle, basically, to get life up and running. And he's an atheist, right? Um, and in a sense, it solves the problem for our planet, but it just moves the problem itself to another venue, okay? Uh, and I have to say, I admire Crick's courage for doing that, but he didn't really solve the problem. So the answer is no, you still have the problem of the origin of life. Now you just have a, to solve it on a planet that you've never seen. <laughs> in terms of an intelligence you don't know anything about. Okay, so the next question is, uh, are the ways to be dead that you mentioned um, talking about physical arrangements of parts uh, is that is that talking about the physical arrangements of parts in a cell um, or something more abstract no it's talking about the physical parts so if you towed up all the parts all the material in a cell there are an indefinitely large number of arrangements of those bits and pieces that will not give you the living state 
Uh, in fact, one guy I didn't have time to quote, he's an origin of life researcher in Germany named Bill Martin. He said, you can take a cell and put it in a blender, crank it up to 20,000 RPM. All the molecules are still there. But you have gone, you have, the physical stuff is all still there, but you've moved out into that big, big space of being not alive. And even though the parts are there, you're never going to get back to that tiny neighborhood where you were alive. So uh, I put, it's interesting, and this is what I put up. I think Dawkins is right here. You know, we, we, we're alive in there, but when we compare this to the universe of possible ways of arranging the physical stuff, we end up somewhere out here. And actually, in that Leventhal Paradox paper, which is so beautiful, you know, science can be really beautiful. That paper is so beautiful. They calculate the number of ways of getting out here, and it's, the, the, the exponents are just astronomically large. And by the way, neither of them, neither of those guys is an intelligent design advocate. They're just looking at this puzzle. Do you believe um, that there could have been other systems um, of life in the, in the universe, perhaps non-carbon-based life? Um, and would that change the intelligent design argument in any, in any way? I would like to say yes. There could be other ways. The problem is describing them. So if you give a biology class the task of describing a cell and avoiding carbon chemistry, <laughs> they'll come back to you after about five or six minutes and say, uh, Mr. Nelson, Paul, I, I, this is a pointless exercise. So you run through the periodic table and, and look at other possible carriers for genetic information. And in one way or another, they don't, they don't work. And what happens is the life that we actually know shares universals. All life that we know has nucleic acid storing information. All life that we know has proteins doing most of the work in the cell. Um, so when you try to describe a living thing and abstract away from the chemistry, you can describe functions. I did that in that mini thought experiment. But you put flesh on those bones, you're going to be pulled back to nucleic acid, you're going to be pulled back to protein, back to polysaccharides, back to lipids, back to the chemistry we actually know. Um, so, yeah, maybe, but spend five minutes trying to describe it and you rapidly find you can't do it. And does that have any bearing on the intelligent design arguments, the possibility of other forms of life or anything like that? Um, well, you want to go really metaphysical? Angels are alive, and angels are not encoded in stuff, right? So, but I don't know how to describe an angel other than to say there's a being standing in front of me that I'm absolutely terrified of, right? And I'm, there's a visual representation to me, but I can't, you know, I don't know what kind of physics is involved there. I want to, I mean, half of me is a scientist, and I want to stay with what I can observe. So it's, I think just starting with terrestrial life, you can make a powerful case for intelligent design. Um, so I guess the answer to that is I would say no, because I can't actually describe what those other ways of being would be. We had a couple of questions asking about the Mars example. Um, the question is, is, the, is it a good analogy to talk about this simultaneous communication with Mars? Um, the argument that they're making is that we have a physical law, basically, that says very explicitly that that can't occur. However, we don't have an analogous, or at least not obviously, a physical law that tells us that life cannot generate from non-life. Um, so is it, is it a good analogy? No, it's just, it's meant, all analogies break down at some point, and there is no corresponding law to the speed limit set for electromagnetic radiation, right? But I'm suggesting there might be. Tomorrow I'm going to have lunch with a very prominent synthetic organic chemist at Rice. And in some of his recent papers and speeches, uh, I think what he has done is he's described the shadow of a science yet to be born. So the, the image is someone standing outside a room, outside a house, near a window, and there's bright sunlight behind them, and it's casting a shadow into the room. And you can trace the outline of the shadow on the floor 
that shadow indicates that there's something standing there. And I think what this scientist has done in his work is he's outlined the shadow of a science that's yet to be born about the nature of the living state. Uh, so I, that another excellent question. I think it's highly suggestive uh, that there might be a science, but I can't give you a law like I could for propagation of a signal through through space that's yet to be worked out. But that parado Leventhal paradox of the interactome, the pieces are there. They're waiting for someone very creative to put them together. We have a couple questions um, asking about evolution. Um, basically, the gist of the questions are, why do so many people believe or accept the theory of evolution, including Christians, um, if the theory is so questionable? Um, and is this maybe to do with people just trying to avoid perhaps um, moral implications of the existence of God or something like that? Um, that's another, another excellent question. I don't like to attack someone's motives because we all have motives. And if I say to somebody, you don't accept challenges to evolution because you're a bad person, right? And you're, you're trying to avoid responsibility to God or whatever. Um, I would rather say that evolution, unlike almost any other scientific theory that I can think of, is the theory about us, right? So wave particle duality of light, plate tectonics, germ theory of disease, global warming. Pick your favorite scientific theory. It's about the world out there. Evolution is about where we came from, why we have moral categories, why we're built as we are, why we behave sexually as we do. All of these things that pertain to us. And because of that, it carries a lot more baggage than any other scientific theory. And I just reviewed a book by a friend of mine, the philosopher Michael Ruse, with the title Darwinism as Religion. And in the book, he argues that evolutionary theory, because it is about us, functions in modern culture very much like a religious worldview. It, can, it deals with ultimate concerns. It deals with how we interact, you know, things that were classically the province of religion. So you know that when you engage this topic with somebody who accepts evolution, people get very testy, right? Very quickly. It pushes buttons for them. And I think that's because it does, it does function in many cases as a kind of religion. Um, but there are lots of reasons people accept theories, and I think that that uh, one of the reasons that I do the work that I do is to try to help people to see that they don't have to look at the world only one way, right? But I never want to say to somebody, you don't accept challenges to evolution because you're running away from God. Maybe they are, but that's not my business to pass that judgment. Um, a related question, um, when we're talking about intelligent design, are we, is this just a placeholder for six-day creationism? Is this, uh, you know, some sort of old earth creationism? Is it theistic evolution? Uh, maybe all or none of those things? Like, what exactly are we talking about as it interacts with Christianity? Well, intelligent design is really a very minimal idea philosophically. What it says, quite simply, is you can detect the action of intelligence in the natural world, full stop. That means that if you're a Buddhist, an agnostic, a Hindu, Islam, a, a Muslim, I lectured quite a bit in Turkey, uh, I've lectured in Brazil, uh, in, lectured in China. Remarkably, the Chinese scientists I interacted with in 1999 were more open to challenging evolution than the Americans at the same conference. American biologists have what I call scopes trial antibodies in their bloodstream. <laughs> <laughs> and they, you challenge evolution, they have the intellectual equivalent of a violent immune reaction. They just shut down. You can see it on their face. The Chinese scientists don't have those antibodies. And they said, eh, if it's not true, we'll try something else. Right? So strangely, America is probably the worst place in the world right now to debate these questions because we have such an unhappy cultural history with these with these debates. Intelligent design is very minimal. And if someone asks me why I'm a Christian, 
I say, read the Gospel of Luke, okay, which is my favorite, right? But if the Gospel of Luke is unpersuasive to you, then nothing that I can say up here will make the least bit of difference, right? If we could replace the Bible, God wouldn't have given us the Bible. So my faith rests on the Bible, and I do this to set science free from its bondage to a really dumb rule that we got in the 19th century called methodological naturalism. So, bottom line, you think you can detect intelligence? Great. Join the intelligent design community. You don't have to be a Christian. You don't even have to be a theist. At Discovery Institute, we have agnostic fellows. They just think they can detect design. Does that help? Sure. Yeah. All right, great. Okay, so if we accept that there is an intelligent designer of some kind, um, then is, is this intelligence alive? And if so, does that just create, again, another just pushing it back another level? Um, well, all explanation has to come to an end, right? I mean, when you explain, you have some effect that you're going to explain with reference to some cause. And if you run that chain back in time to the start of the universe, either you come to a physical thing or a, or a, a physical process of some kind, or you come to a mind. And your explanation eventually is going to end. If it's possible that the universe started with a physical thing, it is also possible that it did not, and then it started with a mind. So I don't, I'm, I don't see that there's a problem, you know, well, who, who created God? No, eventually explanations are going to stop, and you're going to stop at one of two places. You're going to stop with not mind or mind, and I think it's more rational to stop with mind. I don't know if this came up at dinner or not. Maybe it did earlier. You can go hundreds of years before the birth of Christ in ancient Greek philosophy, and you can find ancient Greek philosophers arguing this question, and there's not a sacred text in sight. There's no Bible. They are applying their reason to the natural world. So on the side of design, you have Plato, you have Socrates. On the side of physics, you have Democritus, you have Epicurus. And they're debating this question, does the world make more sense if there's a primal mind or a primal physical thing without any kind of theology in sight? Which tells me these questions don't belong to any particular religion. I mean, I'm a Christian, but you can go anywhere in the world and find people asking the same question. Is there any sort of, of mathematical statistical calculation backing up these, um, the, there's many ways for something to be dead. Um, basically the idea of all of these different yes. proteins coming together um, yes. just by Brownian. If machine. anyone wants, after we're done, come up here and I will, I don't, I think I have some business cards. I will send you all the references in PDF form and you can read these for yourself. And actually, I, one of the things I do at Discovery Institute is I'm sort of they call me the sponge, which is the lowest form of metazoan life, right? It's like four cell types, you know, just sitting there at the ocean floor. I read the scientific literature in depth. So if you want to know more, there's a lot more that I couldn't jam into an hour. I'll send you all of the references. The Leventhal Paradox paper gives the mathematics, uh, the calculation, and uh, it's not that hard to do, actually. It's a combinatorial problem. You can, you can do it yourself. You just have to get the numbers right. Uh, in terms of the parts and how they could possibly interact. So if you want the references and the mathematical rigor, I'm happy to provide them. But I know how I react when I see an equation <laughs> on the screen. It's like, hum that part, right? So um, I tried to make it entertaining. So uh, is the... Uh the infinity, you know, infinite or you know, very large number of uh, possibilities, po possibilities, possibilities for life to arrive. Is this basically just the the same thing as God of the gaps, basically an infinity of the gaps? You could say it's a naturalism of the gaps. Here's the problem: you make this hypothesis, you say it's it's luck, right? Biology class is over in the time it takes you to write luck on the board. Everyone can go, right? That's the answer. There's no knowledge to convey. When you appeal to chance, you have given up 
providing a physical mechanism because actually physical mechanisms are biased. We know this is an object with mass in a gravitational field. We know what's going to happen if I let it go. And I'm not going to because I did that once and I didn't catch it. <laughs> I lost a very good laser pointer. There's a mathematical description of how this object will behave when I let it go. Well, we could perform the experiment, but this was a hundred and fifty dollar remote, and I'm not going to let I'm not going to let it go. But the fact is, when you learn a science, what you learn are biases in nature provided by regularities that are there. Luck doesn't tell you anything, and if we go to that planet where life started by luck, we haven't learned anything. All the same problems will be there. So that's why I say, for Kunin, you know, who I respect very highly, I read every paper he publishes. He bailed out of that problem at that point. Because when you appeal to infinities, you cease to reason. Right? My checking account's overdrawn, so I go to the bank, and not just a little, like five thousand dollars, right? And the bank manager's standing there, he's like, Mr. Nelson, you gotta you gotta take care of this, you know. And I say, Look, we live in an infinite ensemble of universes. How can we be sure that a kindly old woman's not gonna come in here and put ten thousand dollars in my account in the next hour? Since we cannot eliminate that, I'm going to buy that lottery ticket and let's sit down to see what will happen. That is abdicating reason and that's raping probability. No, none of us actually thinks that way. We limit what we appeal to and appeals to luck are not explanations. So we have three questions left. Um, this is a, a deep philosophical question. Um, the question is, since we are basing our knowledge of the world and, and what we consider to be truth on evidence and observation. Um, if evidence and observation aren't objective, doesn't that mean that everything we know could be false? But did I say that evidence and observation weren't objective? I don't hope I didn't say that. I, you know, uh, look, the we we build science on what we know and what we've observed and. I hope that everything that I've said tonight is evidence-based, observation-based. Um, those proteins that I showed, someone did a lot of very, very hard work to solve those crystal structures, a lot of hard observation. So uh, you can't, science would be dead tomorrow if we couldn't observe challenge theories and test them and so forth. So I'm, I'm not challenging evidence and observation in, in any way at all. I think the, the gist of this question is coming from kind of a presuppositional background, if you're familiar with that term. Yeah. So I, I think they're asking is basically if, if humans have a bent, you know, so that, so that we aren't always objective, um, so that maybe we see what we want to see, for example, to avoid sure. religious conclusions. I see, I see. Um, is that a, a legitimate way basically to get out of evidence or scientific consensus maybe that you don't agree with? Um, well, I, I'm an old-fashioned realist. You know, the, the speed of light is the same here in College Station as it is in Moscow. The diploid chromosome number of hum humans' normal number is 48 here. It's 48 in Moscow. Uh, look, si you know, this is... The, the science is just common sense codified. And... Yeah, you can always avoid it by some presupposition, but the great thing about science is not everybody makes the same mistake all the time. And someone is bound to challenge you. If I publish a paper tomorrow about the origin of life from a design perspective, I can count on 10 or 11 people, personal acquaintances of mine, who are going to attack it with everything they can. And science works by that process of beneficial conflict, and the truth emerges in the long run. So please don't leave tonight thinking that I'm challenging science. I love science, truly. Probably in this universe, the only things I love more are God and my wife and my two daughters. But science is really beautiful when, once you get into it. So I'm not, I'm not a skeptic of science. I love it. I am a skeptic of naturalism. Naturalism and science are not the same thing. If you don't remember anything else tonight, take that home.
Naturalism, the belief that the ultimate reality is physics, is not something we know from science. Okay, this is the last question, and it might be the most important one. Uh. Star Wars or Star Trek? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Star Trek. Star Trek. I'm sorry. I was I watched the original 1960s Star Trek. It got my heart, right? Spock, are you kidding me? There's nothing in Star Wars that to, to equal Spock. Thank you guys. You've been a really really great audience. <laughs>